and at our Center for Change Boise office. Um, she's a, a specialist in many things, um, one of which is ACT, and she has amazing presentations around that. She's an incredible um, clinician. She uses art a lot in her um, clinical work, and I really love that. I love seeing the things that she does and the things that she does with her clients, and I'm excited to be able to have Allie join us today. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Allie. If you will go ahead and share your screen, I'm going to turn off my video and my microphone. If you need me, holler. I'll pop right back on. And otherwise, I'll see you at the end and we'll, we'll uh, address some questions at that point. I'm turning All it over right. to you. Excellent. Um, okay. Let me just move this so I can see my screen better. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I've been watching the numbers pop up, and it looks like we have over 500 people here today. So that's really exciting. Love to see the big turnout, and I'm excited to share with you what I've been learning about the past couple months and this past year. So one of the reasons that I wanted to do a presentation on burnout using beyond avoidance and moving towards acceptance is because like Tamara shared, I utilize an acceptance and commitment therapy based approach. And in acceptance and commitment therapy, one of the tenants is the idea of acceptance rather than avoidance. So really trying to figure out how can we combine that with our understanding of burnout. Also, mental health practitioners may not be fully aware of the impacts of profession-related stressors, and they may be less likely to see the need to engage in treatment or preventative measures, or to even seek treatment once their stressors have taken hold. Research has also shown that for some therapists, work-related stress is related to their use of avoidant coping skills and strategies such as denial. And unfortunately, left unresolved, these work-related stressors can set the stage for more serious issues such as burnout or even professional impairment. So who am I? As Tamara said, I am a therapist at our primary center um, in Idaho. So Center for Change Boise, I'm a primary therapist here. And my background is in art and psychology. My master's degree is in counseling from Boise State, go Broncos. And prior to becoming a therapist, I was an art teacher for the city of Boise. And I was also a case manager for refugees. I have a lot of experience working with individuals who are struggling with substance use disorders, alcohol use disorder, college counseling, and of course, eating disorders. And my fun fact is I have two cats and they are named after psychologists. So I have Albert Ellis, also known as Ellis, and Fritz Pearls, also known as Fritz. And as you can see under my photo here, I like to say that I am human first and a therapist second. And so in this presentation and in all of my presentations, I try to be pretty honest about the things that I've learned so that I can help other therapists who are in this field and other therapists who are thinking about going into this field. So these are some of the objectives. Let me just move this up so I can see better of our presentation for today. So attendees will understand the signs and risk of burnout for providers working with clients with eating disorders specifically. And because I am a therapist, most of this presentation is focused on therapists. Attendees will learn the role of acceptance in burnout through an acceptance and commitment therapy approach. And then finally, attendees will learn ways to self-assess for their own burnout and be equipped with practical tools to help them respond. So burnout feels like it's everywhere. Um, recently, I did a little research on different um, articles and different titles that were coming up a lot in the news. So you can see there's a lot of information out there about the mental health crisis in the United States and across the world. Um, there's a couple on there that are specific to Boise, which is where I am located. And also just a lot of articles talking about how mental health therapists are feeling really burnt out and feeling very overwhelmed. So I felt that this topic was very timely and very important for right now. So Freidenberger is one of the first individuals to define burnout. And I'm just going to read that definition for you guys so you can see um, what the original definition is. And then we'll go a little bit further into what burnout looks like. Let me break it down a little bit more. 
So according to Freudenberger, it is the process of physical and emotional exhaustion, fatigue, detachment, and self-doubt that people who work in caring and supportive roles can experience. It's also been considered an occupational hazard by some individuals who say that once you're in the health profession or any profession that provides a caring role, it's just kind of something that you are going to experience, which is more of the side that I've kind of come to terms with and you'll see why throughout this presentation. It's also been defined as unchecked stress. And I actually like this definition because when we look back to the definition of stress by Kelly McGonigal, she says stress is what arises when something you care about is at stake. So it's the idea that we have something that we care about that we're unable to fulfill or that we're unable to change or address. And that's really bothering us. And that's where that unchecked stress comes into. There's also frenetic, underchallenged, and worn out burnout. So frenetic burnout impacts individuals who overwork themselves to the point of exhaustion. So we think about physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted. I would say that this is probably the most common example of burnout that we see and that we think of when we think of the word burnout. There's also underchallenged burnout, which is typically defined by a loss of purpose or disengagement from your work. And then finally, there's worn out burnout which is experienced by workers who have become disengaged from their jobs due to negative feelings. And worn out burnout happens over time. So you think about the frog in a kettle that's boiling. It builds up slowly over time due to consistent poor management or a sense that contributions are undervalued. So just slowly, slowly, you see that um, image there of the books or the dominoes falling over. Everything just kind of falls in place and you lose it and realize oh my gosh, I'm burned out. What do I do now? There are a couple really big drivers for employee burnout that I think are important that we address, especially specifically in the healthcare field or in the field of working with individuals with eating disorders. So the three highest drivers of employee burnout, according to the survey done in 2022, our lack of support or recognition for their work from leadership, or sorry, these are for employees. Unrealistic deadline and result expectations and consistently working long hours or on the weekends. And this is one of the answers to your test. Women and workers under 30 are at highest risk for burnout. And I think there's a lot of reasons why this is, but um, oftentimes these are individuals who are newer to the field if they're under in, in their early 30s or in their 20s. Um, and then our field is really dominated by women. Um, so this is very important just to note, especially for working in a therapeutic setting. A study done found that just one in five percent of workers, or sorry, one in five workers feel able to have open, productive conversations with human resources about solutions to their burnout with just over 56% saying their HR departments don't encourage conversations about burnout. So also when we think about people who are newer to the field and they're experiencing these issues, they're not hearing that this is something that other people are experiencing as well, or they're being discouraged from even sharing with others. So Christina Maslat was a social psychologist who found that detached concern is a crucial mode for caregivers, though different professions approach it in different ways. And I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Sorry, Christina, if I am not. She found that detachment is a protective strategy. However, if the detachment becomes too extreme, the service professional experiences burnout, which is a phrase used by poverty lawyers to describe the loss of any human feeling for your clients. Maslach then created the Maslach Burnout Inventory, which is the leading measure of burnout with Susan Jackson. And you can see that listed here. And I believe that one is available for free online, but I can double check in my resources. Um, and something kind of interesting about Christina Maslach is that she actually witnessed a lot of the Zimbardo prison experiment at Stanford. And a lot of this detachment that she was seeing was things that she noticed from that experiment itself. So she voiced her concerns to Zimbardo and Sparks must have flown because they ended up getting married. So just a little fun fact there. 
And then the burnout assessment tool is also a great way to measure burnout. And it works by having you estimate your own level of burnout symptoms. And that one was created in the Netherlands and is available online. I probably don't even need to show this slide. I was thinking about this earlier. Um, but as we probably all know, the level of burnout rose significantly during COVID. So this is a study from psychologists across the United States, and it was taken um, during the, probably the core years of COVID, I would say. And you can see that a large percentage of psychologists reported that they have not been able to meet the demand for the treatment for their patients. As we saw earlier, there's a, a huge demand and not enough of us. And then secondly, I feel burned out also rose significantly throughout the pandemic. And it did go down slightly in 2022, but not significantly enough to make a very large difference. And this might be why. So across the pandemic, the weekly number of emergency room visits associated with eating disorders among adolescents rose significantly. And specifically, it rose very, very high for females, not as much for males. Um, there may be many different reasons and many different presentations we could do on why that might be, but you can see that a lot of people are struggling, and in the meantime, we are needing to help more people, maybe with less resources, maybe with less availability, and dealing with our own stuff. So we're not very good at taking care of ourselves. It's something that I found out as, as I was researching um, different therapeutic approaches and responses to burnout, we're just not great at it. So the link between burnout and poor health is very well established. Burnout can look like physical exhaustion, maybe getting sick more often. It can look like insomnia, sleep issues. Later, we'll talk a little bit more about alcohol and drug use, different familial issues. So taking your work home with you, irritability kind of goes hand in hand. Um, increased absences, and this may also result from a feeling like you're not doing enough, you're not making a difference. And then finally, lack of empathy. Research also showed that employees who experience true workplace burnout have a 57% increased risk of workplace absence, a 180% risk of increased risk of developing depressive disorders, an 84% increased risk of type 2 diabetes, and a 40% increased risk of hypertension. So as I mentioned, um, this doesn't just affect us physically, but also emotionally. And we're not doing great at addressing it. Around the world, burnout actually has different words. So different countries have come up with different words and definitions for burnout. So in Japan, there is a term called karoshi, which means burnout, which leads to death. And karojisatsu, which is suicide related to being overworked. So in Japan, specifically with Kiroshi, um, there are a lot of videos, a lot of um, photographs of individuals who they kind of look like they're drunk or passed out on the subway or on the streets. And lots of people had been making, you know, funny comments, making fun of them. And then if you dig a little bit deeper, you realize, oh, no, they're just physically completely exhausted. Um, to the point where they're actually dying or completing suicide as a result. China has a similar word, which unfortunately I'm unable to pronounce, but it also is associated with worker death due to overwork. On a positive note, there are a couple countries who are addressing this really um, important and significant issue really well. So in a few European countries, including Sweden, um, burnout is an official diagnosis that can entitle its sufferers to paid time off and other sickness benefits. In Finland, burned out workers can qualify for paid rehabilitation workshops that feature 10 days of intensive individual and group activities, including counseling, exercise, and nutrition classes, which actually sounds pretty nice. In the United States, unfortunately, we do not have a by and large accepted way to address burnout. And oftentimes the individuals feel that they are experiencing it alone, experiencing it alone and may not share with others what they are going through.
Burnout is not a new phenomenon, especially in the field of mental health. So here's Freud, our father of psychology, the OG psychologist. And he actually reported psychotherapy is particularly challenging because of the uncertainty of success. So oftentimes, especially in the eating disorder field, it feels like we are planting a seed, but we don't necessarily see what happens with that seed. We don't get to see the end result. We don't know um, if that individual ended up getting better and thriving and surviving and doing all the things they wanted to do, or if they've just kind of disappeared. So the uncertainty can be really tough sometimes. The human giver syndrome, which is also on your test, is a really interesting term. And it is the contagious belief that you have a moral obligation to give every drop of your humanity in support of others, no matter how much it costs you. And this particularly shows up a lot for women and a lot for individuals in the helping profession in that we just need to keep giving, 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 no matter what the cost to us and the idea that maybe it's selfish if we don't put ourselves last and put others first. Some even say that burnout is an occupational hazard and it is associated with helping professions and unavoidable. So you can see some stats there. There's a wide range of individuals who report experiencing burnout. And I have a couple ideas why the range might be this high. Um, one, I think it can be very shameful to talk about burnout and that you are experiencing it just because of the way that our culture has addressed it historically. Um, and two, maybe people aren't asking, you know, so there are a lot of different factors that could be coming into play. So this occupational hazard can result in practitioners turning to unhealthy and ineffective coping mechanisms or coping skills. So I'm going to go through each of these just because I, I found them pretty shocking. 66% um, of professionals, and these are eating disorder professionals as well, say that they often skip at least one meal a day due to stress and busyness from their workload. Not great. 10% of eating disorder providers reported some unhealthy behaviors to avoid burnout, including drinking alcohol, which we mentioned earlier, binge or emotional eating. So engaging in the same behaviors that we're telling our clients are not good for them, smoking cigarettes, and even self-harm. This was a study that was done in 2012. So I would be curious to see how those numbers have changed. I would imagine that it's probably even higher at this point. One study found that 59% of professional psychologists did not seek therapy despite knowing that it would be to their benefit. And again, I think this has a lot to do with the stigma of burnout and the helping professionals needing help themselves or support themselves. So we do have an ethical standard that we need to refer back to when we think about how we can address these concerns that are coming up. So I've listed two different ethical standards from the ACA or American Counseling Association Code of Ethics and NASA or the um, Social Worker Code of Ethics. Um, and both, of the, both of these talk about how important it is that we address our own impairment and burnout so that we can best meet our professional responsibilities and help our clients. And we can't do that if we're not helping ourselves as well. So this is where acceptance comes in. And this is where things might get a little dicey, but stick with me here. So mess acceptance is the idea of turning inwards with compassion instead of judgment, blame, or shame when we're experiencing burnout. What does the research say about burnout? Well, let's look back to research. I always love to get those numbers, get that um, validated information out there. So acceptance-based treatment may be beneficial for patients with more severe eating disorder pathology, which shows up a lot and kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier with the uncertainty of success. So individuals who are struggling with more severe eating dis disorder pathology, those are the ones that we're probably going to worry about a little bit more, even when the day is done, even when we're at home. Psychological flexibility is associated with lower compassion fatigue and greater compassion satisfaction, which is one reason why I really, really love ACT. And then finally, ACT has been helpful as an intervention for sexual minority employees who are struggling with work stress and burnout. 
Something that I found that is really important to note, because I will be talking about um, how we can use ACT to address our own burnout, is that people who reported feeling that their practice was unsafe were less willing to accept their unpleasant thoughts and emotions and more likely to make judgments about their inner experience. Additionally, people who reported that their practice was unsafe because of work-related conditions were less able to pay attention without judgment and had had higher levels of work-related worry and rumination. And so when we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that our therapists and our staff are safe before we can move towards using acceptance and commitment therapy. So just a caveat that anytime you're trying to use this at your workplace, that should be the very first thing that we're doing. Your, one of your answers to your test is also on this page. So we're gonna rewind just a little bit and talk about what is acceptance and commitment therapy? Where does it come from? Where might it be going? So ACT is considered the third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy. The first wave just really goes back to those basics, you know, giving a dog something to do a trick, punishment, reinforcement, just the basics in behaviorism and conditioning. The second wave includes Ellis and Beck, and it is the idea that our thoughts and beliefs can impact our emotions and our behaviors. That's kind of CBT as we know it, that, that base right there. And then finally, the third wave where ACT comes in, prioritizes processes associated with health and well-being instead of reduction or elimination of symptoms. So this is really different than a couple different approaches that say, you know, maybe we need to do the opposite of what we're feeling, or maybe we need to challenge that thought with something that's the exact opposite. Instead, ACT is saying, let's look at that thought and learn to live with it in a way that is not as overwhelming, not as scary, and still live according to what we value. Acceptance and Commitment Therapy was founded by Stephen Hayes in 1982. So it is a newer form of therapy that is um, coming up more and more often in the eating disorder field. And I discovered ACT in 2019. So right before the pandemic began, actually, I went to a presentation where somebody was speaking about ACT and I thought, wow, that's really cool. And then suddenly I, I had all of this free time um, when the pandemic started. And so I really dove into it. And the more I learn about it, the more I love it. Um, Stephen said that inflexibility happens when we use language and tools in ways that are ineffective or problematic, even if we don't think they are, even if we think they're working, there might be a better solution. The point of ACT is not to necessarily feel better and get rid of all those feelings, but it's to better feel. And again, this is why I really like ACT because it feels very honest and approachable, not only with my clients, but with myself, my life, um, my friendships, my relationships. We're always going to have moments in our lives where we don't feel our best or where we feel anxious, we feel angry. And if we can learn how to live with those emotions in a way that we can hold them out in front of us and not have them completely fused to who we are and our internal systems and thoughts about ourselves, um, then we can live really a lot more effective lives and live according to what we value and reach our goals rather than avoiding what we fear. So this is the ACT Hexaflex for psychological flexibility. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of ACT. If you've heard this before, never hurts to brush up, but if not, I hope you learned something new. So there are six main concepts in ACT that Stephen said all lead to psychological flexibility. And these don't necessarily need to happen in order. It's kind of cool because they all complement each other. So you can work on one, then the other, then maybe two at a time, three at a time, whatever it is, um, because it's very flexible. So we'll go through each of them fairly quickly. So the first one is being present and having a mindful awareness of what's going on in the moment. And again, that goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If our workplace is not safe, it might not necessarily help us if we're trying to be extremely present about what's going on. So we need to address that first. 
It also includes values. So identifying what's important to you. And once you have identified what's important to you, taking committed action based on what you value instead of taking action based on what you fear and what you'd like to avoid. So it's not necessarily the easiest path, but it is one that has more meaning in the end. Self as context is a little bit more difficult to explain without going into an experiential exercise. However, I will try my best. So this is the you that has always been present and will always be present. It's not defined by time or by roles. For some individuals, they define self as context as wise mind or spiritual self. So it's that deep, deep self inside of you that will never go away. ACT also has acceptance in its name. So it is accepting rather than avoiding or suppressing your emotions. And then finally, diffusion, which is the idea of getting some distance from or the literal unhooking from thoughts, emotions, feelings, and body sensations. So it's the idea of saying, I notice I have this thought that I'm anxious and I'm willing to X, Y, Z because I value connection or I value my recovery or I value my authenticity. Um, one thing that really struck me as I was learning about ACT and thinking about this presentation is the idea of acceptance, because it's not really something we hear coming up a lot when we talk about burnout. And my coworker, Danielle Rhodes, shout out to Danielle, encouraged me to do a presentation on this. So it's really fun to kind of dive in and think about what does burnout look like from an ACT lens? So now that we have a general understanding of ACT, we're gonna go back to eating disorder professionals specifically and see how we can use this in our field, in our workplace, wherever we might be. So eating disorder professionals deal with a lot of stuff, whether you are working as a private practice provider, working in residential, working in PHP or IOP like I am, wherever it is, we deal with a lot of things. And a study done in 2012 found that the most frequently cited contributors to burnout were the nature of eating disorders, which can often be very long lasting, unpredictable, can ebb and flow and grow and change. Patient characteristics, including patients who may be struggling with different things that may make it more difficult to relate to them or to feel like you're making progress just because sometimes we don't see it, you know, um, can be tough sometimes. Work-related factors, including schedule and workload. So as we saw earlier in the presentation, um, there is a mental health crisis going on across the world, in the United States, even locally. There's, there's just a lot going on right now. Um, recently, we've had a lot of young adolescents completing suicide really, really close, and the school is very close to our center. So we're seeing that even today. Um, there's a lot of people who are really struggling. And so we have more people struggling and we're wanting to fit them into our schedules, but we might not necessarily have more professionals. And so we may see that workloads are too high. People are feeling burnt out because they're not seeing change. Um, and it can just be really difficult and sometimes a little bit discouraging and honestly sad. Therapist variables also have helped a lot um, with both accepting burnout, conceptualizing burnout, and then probably sometimes have made it worse. So these can include things like your own personal distress tolerance and your risk tolerance. So how much are you able to tolerate that uncertainty of success? Is it really hard for you? I know it's hard for me. Um, or is it something that you're able to hold loosely? And if you're not, is it something that you can remind yourself that you need to hold loosely? Because we don't have control of the outcomes in every single situation and very few times do we. It's also important that we have the ability to seek supervision and be real with your teammates, colleagues, supervisors. You have at least one person that you're able to talk to about what's going on. And if you're not able to, and you have maybe a low distress tolerance, low risk tolerance, and you don't feel like you can talk to anybody, you're probably more likely to feel a little bit burnt out. Further, in this study done in 2012, 
There were themes of over-identification with clients. So oftentimes we mirror clients in our sessions, um, but we might also start mirroring clients and their behavior patterns or the way that we see the world. So for example, rigidity or secrecy or avoidance of our own emotions, things like that. Um, further themes included helplessness and avoidance of affect. And in our field, 93% of therapists report worrying about their patient's health when they leave the office. So this is a really, really high number. Um, a lot of professions, you can go to work, leave your work at the office, and you're done. Um, for us, it's not that easy because our head and our heart are very inter intertwined and really connected with our work. And unfortunately, in the eating disorder field specifically, almost one in four professionals have experienced the death of a patient. And that can be extremely, extremely painful and um, can lead to a whole other slew of issues within the eating disorder professionals wondering what's next, wondering what they could have done differently, things like that, all of which contribute to burnout um, and yeah, just not knowing what's next. So there are a lot of efforts that we have done as a whole to avoid burnout. Um, these include things like self-care, um, treating yourself, getting your nails done, going for a jog, spending time with family, um, whatever it is, you know, just taking some time to take care of yourself. There's also unhealthy coping mechanisms, which we mentioned earlier, including um, even self-harm, skipping meals, turning to alcohol, or maybe even substance abuse. Maybe it'll feel better in the moment, but in the long run, very ineffective and very unhealthy. Uh, theoretical orientation is also a way that individuals have tried to avoid burnout. So like I mentioned earlier, ACT is one of those that is really um, advertised a lot as helping to avoid burnout. And that is something that I'm guilty of as my, my own um, place. But there is a lot of great information out there about ways to avoid burnout. So avoidance is not a terrible thing in and of itself. And sometimes we are past that point and we need to accept what we are feeling and seek support. Denying that you are experiencing burnout or stress prevents you from dealing with the stress itself. It's like sticking your head into the ground like an ostrich or closing your eyes or covering your ears and pretending it doesn't exist. And it's like the analogy of saying, don't think about an orange. So if I could see you all right now, I'm sure many of you are thinking about an orange because I told you not to. So it's kind of the same thing if we are saying, don't think about this feeling, we're more likely to think about it and more likely to experience it. A gap between, between reality and perfection is not abnormal or a sign of dysfunction. It's a normal part of life. Perhaps we have steered too far in efforts to conceptualize burnout as a mental disorder or a syndrome when it is a normal response to a highly stressful and highly rewarding field. So what if we were able to lean more into acceptance rather than avoidance? Following your values can increase meaning, interest, and add fun into our lives, as opposed to going other directions to obtain approval from others or run away from our feelings of discomfort. When we're able to live according to what we value, instead of trying to avoid what we fear or trying to avoid what's hard or uncomfortable, we don't necessarily have a happier life. So research has shown that a less stressful life actually doesn't make people nearly as happy as they think it will. And stress challenges us to find meaning in our lives. So if we think back to that earlier definition by Kelly McGonigal about how stress is what arises when something we care about is at stake, if we're able to use that stress to think about what is the thing behind the stress that I'm really worried about, what is that thing that I value, then maybe we can find more meaning in our lives instead of trying to act like it doesn't exist. So as a practical application, um, I think that this is a really good, uh, good thing to maybe print out, take a screenshot of, 
and just have as a reminder because it's very easy to um, get caught up in stress and to forget these things, even if it's something that you talk about many times a year in different webinars and presentations. So I want you to think about this phrase or this question, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I guess it's more of a phrase, um, but I'm going to use it as a question. So when I was thinking about that phrase, I thought, okay, so what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I don't necessarily think I agree with that because if you're hit by a bus or if you're bit by a shark, does the bus or shark make you stronger? Not necessarily. Does injury or illness make you stronger? Does suffering alone build character and strength? Not in my office. They all leave you a lot more vulnerable. And what makes you stronger is whatever happens to you after you survive the thing that did not kill you. So that's a phrase that we need to work on changing. <laughs> and we can do that by number one, acknowledging stress when you experience it. So instead of saying, I don't experience stress, I'm not nervous, I'm not experiencing burnout, notice it and notice how it affects your body. We can actually welcome the stress by recognizing it as a response to something that we care about. Can you notice that positive motivation behind the stress? What is the value behind that stress? Oftentimes our values are attached to something that we fear losing. So that can be another way to think about it. Make use of the energy that that stress gives you instead of wasting energy trying to manage your stress. So one of the things that um, we learned in graduate school was the idea of thanking your body for giving you stress or anxiety to get you ready for something because your body is getting amped up. It, it feels like we're being threatened in some way. So we're by actually thanking our body. We can use that stress in a positive way instead of saying we're not experiencing this. Stop it. You know, stop being human. So I want you to think about what you can do right now that reflects your goals and your values. Once you've acknowledged your stress, once you've welcomed it, what can you do right now in this moment? Now let's go into some practical tips. So I got some tips for you guys on an individual level and also on an organizational level. Um, because I don't know everybody who's here. It looks like we're up to 600 people now. Welcome, everyone. Um, but some of you are probably in higher positions of power, so you're able to make um, more significant changes within your organization. So on an individual level, exercise can help us complete the stress cycle by physically getting that feeling out of our body. Now, we don't want to overdo it. <laughs> we don't want to be one of the statistics that we mentioned earlier of individuals who are using ineffective or unhealthy coping mechanisms, but this is something that the research has shown. So if you're able to do that and in a healthy enough place, awesome, do it. Breathing mindfully can also help, help us. And so that can really slow us down, help us recognize, you know, what is going on in this moment? What can I do next to respond? Social interactions can be a form of nourishment, which I, I really like that phrase. Um, connection nourishes us. It regulates our heart rates and our respiration rates, influencing the emotional activation in our brains, shifting our immune response to injuries and wounds, so actually helping us heal, changing our exposure to a, stress, a stressor, and modulating our stress response. In fact, a 2015 meta-analysis found that social isolation and loneliness increased a person's odds of an early death by 25 to 30 percent. So social interactions are extremely important, even if you're an introvert like me. Maybe it takes a little bit more work where you need to schedule them, or maybe it even means setting up an appointment with your own therapist um, to get those social interactions just because it is so important um, and important that we're able to talk about what we're going through, not just keeping it all into ourselves or staying alone and isolated. It's important to laugh. So where I work, I, I have some really awesome coworkers and you know, sometimes we write down quotes that we hear throughout the day or we have funny stories that we've encountered throughout the day, either here or at home. Um, and it's important to laugh and find um, joy in the little things or joy in the big things. 
it's also important to show affection to one another. So this can be things like physical touch, hugging, even snuggling up um, to your partner, whoever it is. Uh, having that affection for yourself is very, very important. The idea of rest is really important as well because rest is not just physical. So we know that physical rest can affect our mental and emotional well-being um, as well as our physical well-being. It affects everything. But for this, we are thinking about not just physical rest, but also mental rest because our brain is go, 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 maybe eight to five, Monday through Friday, whatever it is. Mental rest is not about being lazy. It is a time necessary for your brain to process the world and continue to grow. So for example, a muscle that is worked and rested and worked and rested will continue to grow stronger. But a muscle that is just continually worked is likely to result in injury and having to sit off to the side for a bit. Judging yourself for needing to rest is ineffective. Instead, you could say things like, hello there, anxiety. You're here to help me get things done and make sure that I don't fall short. And I recognize the need for rest in order to effectively live out my values. That's kind of going back to diffusion and the idea of connecting to our emotions in a different way where it's more helpful. I also really like this question, really checking in with yourself and asking, hey, body, what do you need now? What do you need in this moment? And responding to it in an effective way. There are some specific questions for supervisors of eating disorder professionals, but I also think even if you're not a supervisor or you don't have an eating disorder specific supervisor, you can use these for yourself. So asking yourself questions um, such as, how do I expect myself to be perfect? And if I do expect myself to be perfect, how do I expect myself to react when I make a mistake? Because you will, we're human. How do I think in terms of good and bad? How comfortable am I expressing negative feelings, asking others to do something for me, or refusing a request when I do not want to do it? How comfortable am I with others when they are out of control? And finally, what emotions do I rarely express? And there are several other questions that are listed in um, the Supervision for Eating Disorder Professionals article that I've linked at the end. Um, but those are just a couple of them that really stood out to me and also go hand in hand with a lot of those themes that we mentioned earlier um, of burnout and eating disorder professionals and how we need to dig a little bit deeper into ourselves in order to know how to best respond when we are in that moment. on an organizational level. So these are the most popular approaches that um, employees reported as being effective um, for as effective supports in reducing burnout. So the first one was having more flexible working hours and a workplace culture that respects time off. The next one is the ability to work remotely, which really went up during the pandemic, but there seems to be a little bit of a trend where people are coming back to the office. Um, that's not something that we did here locally in Boise, but I imagine that's probably very difficult to make that switch back if you've already switched away. A four-day work week sounds awesome. Um, and it's also something that people report as being very supportive to help reduce burnout. And then finally, workplaces that support mental health. And this one is huge and one that I definitely want to dig into just a little bit more because I found some pretty staggering statistics. So while more employers are providing access to mental health services, 67% of employees with mental illness struggle to access those services provided. So we're saying that we are providing these services, but they, the people who need it the most are not necessarily able to get it or access it. This points to a disconnect between employers' perceptions and employees' realities. The same report discovered 71% of employers with frontline employees reported supporting mental health well or very well, which sounds good, right? Well, only 27% of their employees agreed. So really big disconnect. If you are an organization, 
You need to take the time to listen to your employees, talk to them, get feedback and take action because their perception may be very different than what your intention is. And this is the place where if you are in a position of power, making it okay to talk about if you are experiencing burnout, not punishing employees for having a very normal response to a very difficult field. And like I said before, taking that feedback seriously, because you may be very well intentioned and wanting to address these things, but if your employees aren't receiving the same message or aren't able to access those services, you might be missing the point. Some ideas for the future that I had is, you know, just the idea that healing hurts. So what if instead of beating ourselves up for feeling difficult feelings, instead we were able to turn towards them with kindness and compassion towards ourselves? So this is the idea of, you know, thinking about what can we do to be more gentle with ourselves rather than beating ourselves up for feeling feelings in the first place. I like the question of fulfillment. You know, we, we work in a field that is extremely difficult and extremely fulfilling and rewarding. If it wasn't, you know, we probably wouldn't be here. Um, so I love the question to ask yourself, what am I doing when I feel most powerfully that I am doing what I am meant to be doing? Notice what is difficult, or sorry, what is valuable in difficult situations. So again, going back to stress, what is the thing that is at stake for us and noticing that? Know ahead of time that you are entering a field that is difficult and it's also very normal to struggle, even if people aren't talking about it. And that goes with my final point. Create an environment where it is safe to discuss your feelings without judgment. And one idea that I had for this um, that can be really helpful is even group supervision. So a lot of times we have supervision one-on-one -on -one with just your supervisor and supervisee. But if you have a couple other therapists or whoever it is that you're talking about these feelings with, um, it can help take down some of that shame and help people realize that they're not alone in their feelings and that it is very normal to struggle because this is a very difficult field. Okay, we are going to close with an exercise. Unfortunately, I cannot see you, so I need to trust that you guys are doing this, um, but I want you just to take, I'll give you about a minute to grab a piece of paper or scrap piece of paper and a writing utensil. It could even be on your phone if that's easier. Um, something to write something down. So I'll give you maybe 30, 30 more seconds or so. If you don't have one now, you can come back to this later. All right, I wish I could see all your hands, but we'll give you about 15 more seconds if you need to grab something, and then we'll go into our experiential exercise. Okay, so if we were in a large room of people, this would be slightly different, um, but we're going to adapt and be psychologically flexible for an online webinar. So I want you to close your eyes. And I think I can't see you either. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't see you at all. And so I imagine that the other participants, you guys probably can't see each other either. But I want you to close your eyes anyway. And raise your hand if the work you do gets exhausting. Okay, you can put your hand down. Raise your hand if you've ever wanted to quit. You can stick your hands down again. Raise your hand if you've ever asked yourself, how much more can I give before I've done enough? How much more do I have to give? Or how smoothly do I have to polish myself before I can move through the world without friction? I wish we could all see our hands right now because I'm, I'm certain many of you have them up and you are not alone. Keeping your eyes closed, I want you to imagine a new definition of success in your position. 
what does it look like to have a win in a way that cares for both yourself and others? Now you can open your eyes and I want you to write down what this win would be and where you feel most fulfilled in your career. So I'll give you about a minute to get that written out and be warned, this may be life-changing for you. And finally, once you have those words written down, I want you to place these words somewhere you can visit often to remind you of why you were in this field. Why did we get started? Why do we stay? And how to take actions that continue to support both yourself and others because you're just as important. And then to close, I'm just gonna go over some readings that I highly recommend. Um, there's a book I've listed there about burnout. Um, also The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris, which is very act focused. The Upside of Stress by Kelly McGonigal is phenomenal. And I used it for a lot of my research in here. Um, she also has a TED talk, if that's something that you prefer. Um, there's also a qualitative analysis listed there if you are really into research and wanna dig a little bit deeper. And then I have some resources listed. So the Maslach Burnout Inventory um, and the Burnout Assessment Tool. I believe that the Burnout Inventory is the one that you need to pay for and the Assessment Tool is the one that's free, um, but you would have to double check. And then there's also the 2022 COVID-19 Practitioner Impact Survey. So that's kind of a cool, fun read um, to see how COVID impacted practitioners in the United States. And I think it may even have global, global responses as well. And then I have a lot of different references in here. And so um, the supervision for counselors working with eating disorder groups, countertransference issues related to body image, food, and weight is really, really helpful if you're looking for more of those specific questions. And then all my slides. So that is it for my presentation. I have about five minutes for questions. Thank you, Allie. Um, first of all, I'm hoping to get through the last part of this because I was kicked out twice. Um, I think oh, it's no. my, my internet on my end and Shelly was still there uh, making sure things were good and I popped back on. So um, hopefully this will last for a few more minutes. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I want to let folks know if you have an opportunity or if you'd like to, to give Allie a question, now's your your chance to do it if you'll type it in the Q&A tab. And while you do that, I will just remind folks of a couple of things. So when the webinar ends or when you um, exit from the webinar, uh, in the same screen where you are now, uh, the webinar evaluation will pop up. So if you'll just take a minute to take that evaluation, we would appreciate it. That's a continuing education requirement for us. That's completely anonymous. So feel free to be candid in your feedback. We tabulate those results and send those to the CE providers. And then when the webinar ends or you leave, uh, you'll see a new browser tab with the link to take the online test. You need to take the test online in order to receive continuing education credit. Um, uh, once you pass the test, you will see the opportunity to download your certificate on the class marker site. Uh, for those of you, as I mentioned at the beginning, for those of you who may be watching on a phone or a tablet, um, the browser does not pop up. It, it, you might not see it on your screen. You'll probably have to go and look for all your browser tabs on your phone and you should see it there. All right, Allie, let's take a look at Q&A. Shelly, if I get kicked out, I'm just going to let you um, take over <laughs> and hopefully I won't. Okay, Allie, so here's a question uh, from Rebecca. I feel like my burnout has really been from my bosses that are too harsh and fail to recognize the good that you're doing. Um, it's hard for a, perfectionistic, for a perfectionist to only get criticism. How do we handle the burnout? I, I like this question because I feel like sometimes we're scared to say those words um, and be honest about how we're feeling. And so I felt like that would be a good one for you to address. 
Yeah, no, that is good. Um, I would say if you feel comfortable giving feedback to your boss, that's always the first thing that I would do. Um, if you don't feel comfortable giving feedback to your boss, maybe it is an environment that you don't feel safe, um, then I would you know, write down those wins for yourself and maybe talk with your colleagues and so that you can increase that support maybe in a different way. And then finally, if you're really, really struggling, I would always say seek outside supervision. And so maybe the person who's cheering you on the most is not the person who's necessarily in your workplace, but it's maybe someone who's outside of your workplace, but specific to your field, if that makes sense. Thanks, Allie. The next question is from Andrew. When you talked about dis diffusion in parentheses distance, I have this thought of anxiety. Did you mean as opposed to saying slash thinking I am anxious? Can you speak more about the significance of this difference? Yes, I love diffusion. So I, I love that you had this question. So I'll just give you a brief overview of the difference between fusion and diffusion. So fusion is the idea of having a bubble on your head. And so saying I'm anxious and diffusion is being able to take that bubble off and saying, I notice I have the feeling of anxiety, or I notice I have the thought that I am anxious and X, Y, Z. So it's just adding in a couple different words where anxiety doesn't necessarily define you, but it is something that you experience. Thank you. We have time for one more question. This is from Helen. Regarding eating disorder treatment teams and college counseling centers, what are suggestions for balancing burnout prevention and having the few clinicians who are more knowledgeable about eating disorders on the team? Ooh, that is tricky. Um, so I, I guess a follow-up question, would that be burnout prevention maybe for all providers? Sure, let's or, go with that. <laughs> okay, yeah, so... That is tricky. So what I would say is, again, being able to have those open conversations with your team. Um, maybe it's even a smaller team where I know when I worked or interned at a college counseling center, we had the counselors and social workers, psychologists, et cetera, and then also the medical staff. So maybe even having a separate supervision with just the mental health side of things so that you guys can talk and be real with one another. Um, but also knowing if your workload is too high, knowing what resources might be local or national where you could refer people out. Um, the nice thing is that there's a lot more online resources than there used to be. And so there may be um, more providers to help out with eating disorder specific care. Thank you. Our thanks again to Allie Willits for presenting today and uh, our thanks to all of you for attending. We so appreciate it. Take good care and we hope to see you next time. Bye. Bye guys.